There's research done that diverse spaces, no matter how much time it takes to get to a middle ground, like, are way more beneficial to society. This is A New Angle, and I'm your host, Justin Angle, marketing professor at the University of Montana College of Business. This podcast is my chance to speak with cool people doing awesome things in and around the great state of Montana. We are proudly underwritten by First Security Bank and Blackfoot. Hey folks, welcome back and thanks for tuning in. Today I speak with Vasu Sajitra, a professional athlete and activist based in Bozeman, Montana. Vasu is driving an important dialogue about diversity, equity, and inclusion in the outdoor space. And this conversation might push you to reconsider how you think about people with disabilities, conservation, and inspiration. Conversations like this one can be uncomfortable, and that discomfort is important. Perhaps now, more than ever, we all need to seek out perspectives that differ from our own. That's where we learn and grow, and hopefully come together to make a better society. I learned a lot speaking with Basu, and I hope that you do too. I'm excited for you to hear our conversation right now. Okay, so we're here today with Vasu Sajitra. Vasu, thanks for coming on the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me, Justin. Yeah, happy Indigenous Peoples Day, by the way. Indeed, we are recording on Indigenous Peoples Day, and it's important to commemorate that for sure. So how 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 are you doing right now? I mean, this is sort of a fraught time where we're a few weeks out from the election. This will roll after the election, but um my guess is you got some excitement building about ski season, but also it's it's sort of a fraught time in this country. How are you holding up? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I am, how I tell people and my friends whenever they ask me this question is, I am coexisting between grief and gratitude and trying to keep my head above water as much as possible. So uh, <laughs> yeah, that's my that's my go-to right now. Yeah, that is a great way to put it. Grief and gratitude um, and some continuum between the two. Yeah, important to think about that. So for for listeners that that aren't familiar with you, you are an adaptive professional athlete sponsored by the North Face. You're an activist. You're so many things. Um, How would you describe yourself? Yeah, so um, my typical intro is... My name is Vasu Sojitra. My pronouns are he, him, his, and I live on the lands, uh, the unceded lands of the Crow, Northern Cheyenne, Salish Kootenai, Blackfeet, Shoshone, Bannock, and many other tribal nations, um, so, as uh, most people know it as uh, Bozeman, Montana. And I'm a person of color, um, specifically a first generation Indian American. And I'm also a uh, person with a physical disability, specifically a limb difference amputation of my right leg. I also identify as an athlete, an activist, an advocate, um, and all the things that put people first, whether that be employment-based or healthcare-based or um, outdoor recreation-based or land protection-based, whatever it may be, stewarding um, is always trying to put people first and putting our relations with people and our um, other than human beings first and foremost over money and greed. So that's kind sure. of my um, ideology when it comes down to living my life. Yeah. And I think that is condensed very well into, you know, your, your, I think it's your tagline on Instagram, ninja sticking through the woods to bring intersectionality to the outdoors. I mean, that, that kind of sums up a lot of that worldview in an elegant way. Um, tell us about ninja sticking. What's that all about? Yeah. So, um, that motto came about when I was climbing the Grand Teton with a, with a guide and a friend. Mike Gardner, um, and he was watching me on these precarious ledges with like 2,000 feet drops next to us, and I was just casually walking on my crutches, you know, just like um, <laughs> making it seem like no big deal, but my heart was racing, of course. Sure. Um, and he he kind of surfaced this new term, ninja sticking, and I kind of stuck to it. It just kind of had this really fun ring to it, and you know. Um, now that I look back at it and now I, now that I incorporate it into my daily life, it's, um, it's a 
it's given me a good paradigm shift and reframing of what disability really means. And for me, I'm very much prideful of um, having a disability um, in our society nowadays. Uh, disability is usually looked at uh, with pity or looked down upon or folks with disabilities are um, treated as second class citizens, anything that's pretty much negative. And uh, the idea behind that term is to make it a, create some sort of paradigm shift in people's brain of like, you know, having crutches is not a big deal. It's just how we utilize it and how what resources are available to us to be able to utilize them. So the same goes with wheelchairs, same goes with other disabilities as well and folks that use other medical equipment. So that's the idea behind ninja sticking. And then, of course, the other jargon within the phrase is intersectionality, which incorporates a lot of different identity spaces into our society in a way that's um, either oppressive to those identity spaces or provides privilege to those identity spaces. So uh, just understanding the slight nuances that come with um, a lot of those, whether it be, you know, black, queer, gay, disabled, um, any of those um, identity groups, there's a lot of different variations that can be created and a lot of different oppressive systems that can um, impact our livelihood. So just incorporating that, and of course, given that I'm a outdoor athlete and activist and predominantly spend my t- time on the lands, on trail, on my ski, whatever, um, I try to focus a lot of that paradigm shifting energy based around systems of oppression into the outdoor space. So that's kind of the uh, breakdown of my little motto that I've created. <laughs> sure. And, and so let's, let's, um, let's dig a little deeper into the, you know, the mindset with regard to, to, to your disability. I mean, you lost your leg very early in life and I've heard you speak about the role your brother played in kind of um, just pushing you to do stuff. And you know, how, how did you get to a point where, where kind of you are today in terms of your outlook on, on the way you approach what your body can and can't do? Yeah, my brother was a big, big advocate. He was my first ally before I even know what the hell ally really meant. Sure. Um, and he was kind of a co-conspirator. He would stand for me, stand with me whenever um, shit hit the fan kind of thing. And people were bullying me or talking crap about me. So he was always there for me. He still is always here for me, even though he lives in Brooklyn couple thousand miles away so yeah that was that was incredibly important we would spend a lot of time outside together with other friends in the neighborhood and yeah he was uh he was more around the tough love scene so if i had fallen he'd tell me to get up on my own or if we were going down a steep run on the ski hill he would tell me just like you know you can do this like just get up and try again kind of thing um which helped build a stronger backbone for me and uh, some thicker skin when it came to navigating different spaces, and that's kind of the that's kind of the concept I've brought into my daily life to other folks as well. Trying to, you know, incorporate mountain culture into day to day culture. Um, so that's that's where my brother was a huge impact um, when it came to giving me, providing me um, a path towards self resiliency, um, and be able to you know get up every every four times I'd fall on. I'd get up five times kind of thing. Um, so that's, uh, that was the, that was a big impetus towards me having a voice and me fighting for others to have a voice as well at the table. And that was a, yeah, that was monumental for sure. Yeah. Were there any moments where y- you sort of, you know, your brother didn't kind of give you any slack if you will, and push you to do stuff, do stuff for yourself and, and at what stage did you start to kind of sort of internalize that outlook and, and, and make it your own? Was it right from the start or did you kind of grow into that? No, it was, a, it was a, quite the process. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was, um, it took a fair amount of time. I mean, I'd say pretty much middle of college is when I really found my calling for the most part. Okay. Um, and this is at University of Vermont up in Burlington, right? Yeah. yeah. So I was studying mechanical engineering and um, kind of focusing on that. And then I kind of shifted towards adaptive sports as my junior, senior year came around and started focusing a lot more on my skiing, um, which I had no intentions of going towards a pro athlete career. But 
things started, you know, falling into my lap and I started creating opportunities for myself. So it was a combination of the two. And my brother was definitely one of those resources as well. And he would, um, he would definitely provide opportunities for me, but also like know what I was capable of and only help when I really needed it. So like either carrying food or water or something like that, but otherwise like he'd let, he'd push me to do it all by myself just to, you know, be able to build that resiliency as I was talking about. So kind of the same thing happened. Um, and once, uh, once I started skiing a little bit more, same process of like, no, I can do this on my own. I just need a few different resources, whether that be different equipment or um, different gear that's not really out on the market. So we had to create it ourselves, um, myself. So it, uh, it was quite the learning curve when it came down to it because it was all just like brand new and I was kind of inventing my own backcountry ski methods. Yeah. And I'm sure in the midst of studying mechanical engineering, that's sort of a, a, a fun kind of thing to be constantly tinkering with how to get your system optimized, I would imagine. Yeah, it's uh, I do. I did really enjoy it. Um, I always, you know, think I could make it better or fix it or, you know, I'm always trying to find solutions to barriers or problems that might come up. So that was, uh, that has been fun. That was fun in the process. You know, I still run into barriers and things like that, either societally or um, emotionally or psychologically or physically, um, and just trying to figure out different ways of um, creating solutions around um, how to make that resource available. So, yeah, that that was a that was a big, another uh, monumental uh, shift in my life when I started pushing myself into that country. Yeah, and at what point did you connect with Vermont Adaptive? That was senior year of college. Okay. It was, uh, I was volunteering down at the Lake Champlain docks and they were doing like a kayaks, you know, weekly kayak program. And I was helping out during the summer and um, the director for that program was also the director for the ski program at Sugarbush. And she offered to, offered an internship program for me. And I was like, sure, sweet, like get to ski and try to make a difference and kind of get paid might as well give it a shot i wasn't really doing anything that winter i was trying to figure out my life after uh after i graduated and uh yeah i kind of just kick-started a, a new new career for me based off of that and so did that like what was the what was the path from there to bozeman because i know you're, you're starting to kind of get some pub as a skier. You had a film that, that, that got pretty widely circulated. And then, and then what was the kind of the dots that led you to Bozeman? Um, it was one of my friends. He really wanted to move out West and I wanted to move out West just for a little bit, just to test out some of the skiing out here. And, uh, he was like, his name is Alex Holt and he, Alex was dead set on moving to Bozeman. And I'm like, yeah, sure. Whatever. Like I, I had a, gotten a job at, in park city but then i started researching what park, park city was and i was like oh i don't really want to live in you know a super bougie place whatever i want to live in a town like kind of like burlington you know so um yeah we did a little bit of research on bozeman but it was pretty much sight unseen and we got here and i was like oh this is a sweet town like ski hill is 15 miles away and it's a college town there's actually it's not just like tourist based and um, there's a lot more going on here. So, uh, yeah, pretty much stayed here, applied, started working at Eagle Mount Bozeman and adaptive sports organization in town here. And I told myself I was going to stay for two years and six years later, I'm still here. So it's kind of a, <laughs> kind of sucked me in a little bit. Um, but all good. I've learned so much from working at Eagle Mount and, and, you know, helping start a different organization as well. So all uh all part of the process yeah what's the what's the state of play at, at eagle mount right now are you able to run much programming with COVID, or have you had to really sort of change what you're doing um so i'm not actually affiliated with eagle mount anymore i was oh no longer okay yeah because of COVID, there was a lot of funding issues and a lot of the program staff were let go just because the program wasn't running throughout the summer so um yeah i'm, I'm kind of actually shifting gears entirely because i've been wanting to step 
down from Eagle Mount and this kind of pretty much created the decision for me. Okay. Um, yeah, I've been I've been seeking out um, grad school. I'm not sure what's going to happen here, but uh, eventually go to grad school. But uh, right now, I'm mostly focusing on um, advocacy and um, my professional athlete career. So those are kind of the two branches I've been spending most of my energy on and uh, building different businesses based around diversity, equity, and inclusion within the outdoor space. Yeah. So let's talk about that advocacy work. Um, you've been pretty outspoken about the you know, equity in general, but uh, particularly in, in, in the outdoors, in the outdoor industry. How did you come in to finding your voice as an as, as a activist? So what I'm hearing is, how did I become radical? <laughs> oh, I don't know if I'm suggesting that. I mean, I, I think that that how did you get to a point where you just decided I, I, I want to dedicate my life to, yeah, to getting uh, the word out about what I believe in, whether it's radical or not? Um, it was definitely um, working at Vermont Adaptive and working at Eagle Mount definitely helped sculpt an idea in my brain around disability um, and what what people and families and folks with disabilities really go through. Um, I mean, I personally have a lived experience as someone with a disability, but my lived experience is not the same um, as others. And um, I personally know, like, I have financial resources compared to a lot of other folks. So, you know, learning about that was a huge aspect in um, pushing myself towards more of the um, advocacy world. Like just talking to the participants that come skiing or camp to the camps or their family members or caregivers, um, whoever, like just hearing about the struggles that they're going through, especially in such an affluent town like Bozeman, um, just hearing like they're still, you know, poor is just poor no matter where you are. So, you know, they're just, yeah, expressing those concerns and issues that they're running into. And um, that was a huge part of like understanding systemically what was happening to folks with disabilities and then um, another friend of mine Nikki Bailey was adamant about trying to diversify her friend group as well as have a stronger understanding of uh, racial issues as well so and I was kind of in that space throughout primarily again disability but started dabbling in race a little bit and then we kind of started volunteering for local organizations that were um that were fighting for racial justice and started learning a lot more about that i started learning a lot more about it um, reading listening to podcasts um, going to different spaces or affinity spaces whether it be you know the indian um, south asian club on campus or uh, the black student union or uh, American Indian Council, any of these spaces that are um, open to the public and um, was able to go and just like learn, listen, understand. And then we were reached out to by that organization, Montana Racial Equity Project, about issues around the outdoors when it came to BIPOC, uh, Black Indigenous People of Color. Um, and we based around a conversation at that organization's table, um, we created an organization called Earth Tone Outside MT to elevate people of color in the outdoors here in Montana, specifically the Gallatin Valley. And that kind of pushed me into the more racial justice, social justice world of the outdoors. And I started connecting a lot more with um, different national space, spaces like um, indig Indigenous Women Hike, Brown Girls Climb, you know, Brothers of Climbing, all these other spaces, um, what, Outdoor Asian, so like all these spaces, we just started connecting online through Instagram. And yeah, they do a ton of different meetups and different festivals and events. And while that was all happening, I was connecting with North Face and uh, North Face was pushing for DEI stuff and is still pushing for DEI stuff. And I was able to kind of combine those efforts to be able to, um, build my voice around a lot of that. And what was your experience, you know, thinking just about your, your kind of personal learning as you're exposing yourself to these other groups, learning more about these people and their experiences and their perspective and where that perspective comes from. I mean, it sounds like you've, you've 
had the courage to put yourself in some learning spaces where maybe you're you're less comfortable and you're forced to confront some of your own worldview. Um, can you talk about that? Like how, how did this experience push you? Yeah, I mean, um, I definitely put myself into spaces that I didn't identify with. So like I would, me and my friend Nikki would really incorporate ourselves into um, the queer community. Um, they were doing a lot of events, whether it be speaking engagements or like, or a speaking series or uh, movies or dancing or drag shows, anything like that. We would really just like put ourselves in those situations. It was slightly uncomfortable at the start because I didn't really know too much about the queer culture. So that was, that was a definitely a, um, um, an eye, eye-opening experience and I'm still learning about it because I do not ident- identify within that community. But yeah, it was, uh, it was definitely an eye-opening experience. I was very much open to, am, am open to learning. And it was, a, it was a great way to like get out of my bubble that Bozeman tends to create, that a lot of these mountains tend to create. And um, we mostly stick around not diverse groups, but mostly user groups. So like all the skiers stick to the skiers, all the climbers stick to the climbers, all the runners stick to the runners kind of thing. But there's not a lot of cross cross pollinating when it comes to actual diversity, which includes race, ethnicity, sex, gender, disability, socioeconomic status, all that kind of stuff. So, um, so that was a, that was definitely a good learning experience. I got called out constantly and I still get called out constantly, which is fine. I, you know, I'm very much okay being uncomfortable in, um, when people are, you know, trying to hold me accountable. So yeah, that that definitely helped build that muscle up a lot more. At first, it was definitely way more uncomfortable, of course, but you know, it takes a slow process to like get used to that and make sure like it's not based around ego when it comes when people are calling folks out about these problematic behaviors. It's more just based around like we want you to be more compassionate, so please understand what we're going through, so we can work together. A New Angle is brought to you by First Security Bank and Blackfoot, two cool companies doing awesome things all over Montana. Hi, this is Mike Morelli, Director of the Entertainment Management Program at the University of Montana, and you are listening to A New Angle. So that that was the idea that shifted in my brain throughout that process. Yeah, is there a particular memory that stands out as a moment where that kind of exchange was was effective? Yes. So I, um, there was a speaker that came for Montana racial equity project and they, they pronounced a word wrong. And I had the audacity to raise my hand and try to correct this person. And this person was a woman, black woman of color. And, um, given our racial systems and patriarchal misogynistic systems that are in play, my, intentions did not um, overlap with the impact of me trying to correct this individual. Um, It definitely 100% came off as mansplaining. And that was incredibly problematic on my behalf. And I was very much aware of it after the fact I did that. And I was like, Oh, crap. Um, But of course, it happened. And I had regret. And people called me out on it. And I learned from it and I made sure to never do it again. So that was kind of the process. It was definitely uncomfortable as hell. At the oh, yeah. And I realized like, nah, I have to sit with this discomfort and learn from it and make sure I don't do it again. Yeah. And I like how you put that, you know, intentions didn't align with impact. Um, talk about that a little bit more. What do you mean by intentions and impact and how do they, how do they differ? Yeah. Like, you know, my intentions were just like, oh, you know, given that, um, I like things pronounced correctly within my culture. Like, I think it'd be nice if everyone was able to do that. Right. So like, that was my intention was like, Oh, I just want to make sure like we're pronouncing this correctly. So we're respecting this culture, but given my identity as a, as as a man of color and trying to like puff my chest out or whatever to like correct this individual as a woman of color, it's the impact of it came off as you know part of a patriarchal misogynistic system where i was trying to hold power over her her 
making her feel inferior to what I knew or the knowledge I had. So that was, um, that in hindsight, it was incredibly problematic. Um, sure. and it was definitely a learning experience. Unfortunately, that learning experience came at the emotional, um, burden to a woman of color. So, um, after I realized that I've been intentionally in my life, trying to make sure I don't ever create learning experiences for myself based off other people's relived trauma. Um, yeah. It, it makes me think about, I, I, I can't remember which interview it was with you, but we were talking about, you know, this concept of inspiration and, you know, that it's, it's, there's a lot of problems associated with the notion of, of uh, an able-bodied person looking at a disabled person as inspirational, um, in, in ways I, I, that had not occurred to me. Can you, can you talk about that, but, uh, inspiration versus motivation and kind of how we, you know, can draw, um, messages from others in, in ways that maybe don't objectify them or what's the healthy way forward through that area? Yeah. So first off, I would say do for vocabulary sake, like people with disabilities is the correct vernacular for most people oh, okay. um, that don't identify with a disability just because like in our space and time in our society like currently people are still people with disabilities are still looked at as inferior um, so people with disabilities come off a little bit uh, more compassionate or the, that phrasing just comes off a little bit more compassionate I personally switch between that person first language with identity first so like i call myself a disabled person but that's with a capital d mostly because again i'm very much prideful of having a disability okay. um and that that i only allow my friends to call me once they realize that disability is not a bad thing hmm. so, so they one, kind of have to earn that right is that what you're saying a little bit kind of i mean they have to prove it through their actions that like they understand that disability is part of human biology and it's part of the diversity spectrum of how people develop throughout our lives and in society. So once we figure out like, you know, disability is not the problem, it's how we provide access to folks that have different, um, different uh, abilities. So like how, how do we do that? Um, so that's, that's the kind of the, the concept. I'm not trying to be a gatekeeper. That's just like the idea that I have worked around of like, you know, I, I mostly call it my disabled friends, disabled friends with a capital D, just because I know that they're prideful of having a disability or if they're not, then I don't, that's pretty much it. You know, it's, it's asking how they want to identify, but anyways, back to No, your I get it. That's an important, I mean, that's an important distinction that I, I had, had never occurred to me, but it's, it's a, it's a subtle piece of language difference that, that has great meaning. And I think it's. Yeah. As you said, it's incumbent upon all of us to kind of learn from that stuff and understand the implications of these these language choices. Yeah, it's um, identity first language is a way to reclaim our identity. Mm -hmm. It's kind of how the queer community took back the word queer because it was derogatory back in the day. So it's a, it's kind of a, yeah, kind of the same same there. And uh, yeah, I mean, like you know, you you go into spaces like you know the deaf community is the same. They don't want to be called people that are deaf. They want to be called deaf people with a capital D. Same with the blind community. They want to be called blind people um, with a capital B. So like all these, and same with like, you know, not disabled, but indigenous people, they want to be called indigenous people with a capital I. So it's like, you know, just reclaiming these identities in a way that's positive and, you know, part of our ecosystem. And once we realize like, oh yeah, you know, their people, these are their identities, they hold power in those identities, like then we can start like, really um, being in solidarity with them with the language that uh, comes with identity first. Yeah, and I think that distinction is, is, is really powerful. I mean, people sort of throw their hands up in the air and say, Oh, you know, I didn't use the right word or the right pronoun or the right this or that. And, and they're sort of retreating to this place of what, what they sort of feel is safety. But it, it, to me, it, it doesn't acknowledge that language is reflective of a lot of power structures, right? And, and you might feel like 
your language choices are just normal, but they're reflective of a certain, uh, you know, a certain hierarchy, if you will. And what you're talking about is some of the implications of that. And the, some of the efforts of a lot of these communities to, as you say, mm -hmm. positively reclaim territory that, that is their own. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And, and it's a, it's definitely a slow process, but sure. When, when it works, it's, it's pretty um, influential in creating more power in these spaces. So but, let's, yeah. So let's go back to that inspiration motivation piece. If you, if you are, are you willing to kind of touch on that? Yeah, a little bit. Sure. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the word inspiration is very loaded within the disability world and it's evolved heavily throughout the past couple decades, just because of um, disabled folks having access to a lot of different um, resources, which is great. But on the other hand, still not having those same access. It's getting there with the ADA and a lot of these adaptive equipment. But yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely evolved. And especially in the outdoor or athletic world, um, most people look at um, adaptive athletes as inspirational just because I, I really think most non-disabled people don't really know what else to say other than that word because it's been constantly dug into us to be that's how uh, disabled people are looked at as and it's incredibly objectifying you know we're not out here we're not out here to motivate non-disabled people to continue to live their life and in a very uh inspiring way i guess um we're out here to just push our bodies just like any other athlete any other person uh, with the resources that we have available. So for me, it's my ninja sticks or my crutches. And um, that's kind of the idea that I'm going behind. And for and I was talking to a friend on trail. I was like, you know, if, if you're inspired by me, then try to break down the ableist systems that are keeping more folks with disabilities off of the trails or break down the ableist systems that are, you know, not providing the right health care to folks with disabilities or the right education or still segregating folks with disabilities from non-disabled spaces. Like if you're inspired by me, then do that, you know, instead of trying to focus on your life, it's not, what I'm doing is not to center your needs. It's to center the needs of the disabled community. That's kind of the, the idea behind um, the loaded evolved term of <laughs> inspiration or inspire. Yeah, hundred percent. That makes a ton of sense. And, you know, it makes me think about, you know, this might be a nice transition to your work with the North Face being picked up as, I believe their first adaptive athlete. Is that, is that correct? You were the first adaptive athlete sponsored by the North Face? Yeah. It's kind of like a bittersweet title, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, we, we go through, yeah. Cool, but it's also like shit, 2018 and I'm the first disabled athlete. Fuck. <laughs> All right. What was the, uh, I'm trying to remember the Ruth Bader Ginsburg quote, or maybe it was the Sandra Day O'Connor quote, like, you know, when will, when will there be enough women on the Supreme court? And, you know, she said when there are nine of them or something like that. Oh yeah, exactly. Um, um but yeah, I mean, let's, let's talk about that because, you know, the, the outdoor industry has, has plenty of issues, plenty of work to do. We can talk about that work, but you know, the North face has been, um, to the extent that good work is doable, North Face has been doing some good work and you've chosen to affiliate with, with that brand. Um, talk about that opportunity and that decision. Yeah, totally. Um, so that that came on behalf of building relations with Conrad Anker here in Bozeman. Uh, he's a Bozeman local. So that, that was kind of coincidental. I had no idea he lived here until, you know, someone said he does. I was like, oh, cool who is he? <laughs> so <laughs> that was like, that was like seven, eight years ago. So I wasn't really sure. But, um, and then of course now I'm like close friends with him and his family. And he definitely pushed me to be on the North face team. And, um, it's an incredibly amazing opportunity and I'm very much grateful for it. And, you know, it's, uh, they are very much open to feedback, especially cause they haven't worked with many, um, disabled athletes before adaptive athletes before. So, which I'm very much also grateful for that they are wanting to incorporate my voice in a lot of these um, more strategic planning ideas around a lot of their content. So yeah, excited to see how that all 
grows and comes to um, and how to incorporate more disabled voices um, or and or like different um, ethnicities and race and gender and sexuality. So, yeah, super cool that they're open to a lot of that feedback and already doing that work behind the scenes with their diversity and inclusion team, um, really putting their, you know, walking the talk and putting their money where their mouth is kind of thing with supporting a lot of BIPOC organizations and adaptive organizations and queer led organizations. So um, really awesome that they are doing that kind of work. Yeah. Can you talk about some of the initiatives in, in particular? I mean, it goes much further than just sort of, well, I mean, it's, it's, it's important to be thoughtful about how the imagery you represent in, in your marketing materials. Um, that has a lot of impact, but um, beyond that, what, what, um, what sort of things is the North face up to? Um, so they have a full yearly audit that they do, and I can definitely share with you that, but um, so they are underneath the VF Corp. Mm-hmm. Or, Vanity Fair. Yep. Um, and Vanity Fair is the one with the D, um, diversity and equity or diversity and inclusion um, office. And um, they are, you know, North Bay specifically have an Explorer grant. It's called the Explorer Fund that provides, you know, funds and resources to primarily underserved communities, which is awesome. Um, they're in the works for a lot of different, um, initiatives around that, that I can't really talk about right now because it's kind of a hush hush, but, um, sure. yeah, more focused on that Explorer fund. And, um, the biggest part I keep, you know, hearing is in, within the BIPOC community is like, we're looking for better or not better, but we're looking for mentorship and how to be better at what we do. And that's kind of the next step for North Face and, um, creating, mentorship opportunities for a lot of BIPOC youth. So that's, that's super awesome. And I'm excited to see that they VF and North face and all the other branches, um, utilize ethical, um, source material as well as, you know, distribution and production processes. So that's really cool. Once I figure out, you know, once COVID is slowing down, hopefully, I would love to check out some of their factories overseas and just see how books are, you know, incorporated within the VF model and TNF model. So it seems like they're really creating opportunities for a lot of their workers and focusing on a lot of the sex trafficking that might happen in a lot of South Southeast Asian countries. Um, So really cool. And, you know, focusing on more women of color leadership and, you know, BIPOC leadership they have a pretty solid 2030 plan of having 50, 50 women leaders. Um, and also around, I want to say between 20 to 30 BIPOC leaders within VF and TNF. So that's, uh, that's pretty cool to see that they're trying to really push for equitable leadership when it comes to a lot of these structures. Yeah. So, I mean, the list goes on, but those are kind of just the highlights that I remember. Sure. And one of the, I mean, one of the areas that you see focused on a lot um, by outdoor industry marketing and outdoor uh, industry folks in general is the the issue of public lands and conservation. Um, But this conservation concept is, is, is problematic in some ways. I mean, it's not necessarily an indigenous concept. Um, Talk about your feelings about conservation. Yeah. I don't really use that word anymore is the thing just because the word conservation is also incredibly loaded and uh, based around racial structures that completely cut out indigenous way of stewarding the lands. Um, And I mean, I know conservation was, you know, what John Muir era, and once you look back at John Muir's like legacy or whatever you want to call it, like he yeah. was he was incredibly racist, especially towards indigenous people, um, calling them the S word and just like not acknowledging the amount of work that they put into um, providing a reciprocal ecosystem. So, yeah, that that I've definitely pushed away from, and I mostly stick to like environmentalism or stewardship, and that's kind of the the problematic you know, concept is like a lot of these conservation, quote unquote, conservation organizations 
are based on John Muir's idea of what conservation is. You know, we, we have, you know, it's, it's strange. Like in the U S we compartmentalize everything. Um, and conservation is in its own bubble. Outdoor recreation is in another bubble. Urban areas is in another bubble, but it's like, you know, once we start realizing that just being outside in green spaces and outdoor spaces is healing for all community members, that's when we start realizing stewarding any land, whether it be urban or rural or, you know, wilderness or whatever is going to be beneficial for everyone. And, you know, once we start realizing that it's it's super, it's going to, it's going to be a huge shift. And I think most of it's going to start from indigenous leaders really focusing their land-based practices into a lot of these problematic organizations or creating their own, which I've started seeing as well. So yeah, there's definitely a huge shift happening within that space. Why do you think those bubbles, you mentioned these bubbles, right? Why do you think these bubbles exist? Is it just the market forces that that drive it, the way our society is sort of structured, or is it something about people? Like what, 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 what do you think is going on there? I don't know. Yeah, I always, so any relationship, I always bring back to power and control. Okay. Um, whether that be, you know, a romantic relationship or a friendship or uh, a relationship with your boss or whatever it may be. So it's like, I, the way my brain works is like, I'm looking at these spaces that are incredibly white, incredibly privileged. Like most of them just want to keep their power and control to what they have and continue continue that complacency which in itself is incredibly racist and cause continues the ball of racism to roll down the hill whereas if we started branching out to these different organizations and different in, in identity spaces and communities like that power and control will have would have to be distributed and i don't think people want to lose that you know, that's the hard part is like losing privilege and losing power is incredibly uncomfortable. Like I, you know, we, we won't have our hot tubs or Maseratis or whatever it may be <laughs> if we do lose our power and control. Um, yeah. But, I mean, it, it, it certainly relies on some incredible altruism, altruism at the end, at the level of the individual. And you wonder like, is it more addressable at the level of policy? It's hard to know um, what the best way forward is. Well, I, I personally think policy will be the biggest change maker possible. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's literally what has created these racial structures within the U.S., whether that be redlining or new Jim Crow that's been happening with mass incarceration. So it's like all of these things are caused because of horrible racist policies that have been in play for since the U.S. became the U.S., whatever, in the 1400s or 1600s, whatever, whichever one you sees fit but it's uh yeah once we start creating more anti-racist policies quote like you know one obvious one is the affirmative action uh policy for colleges so it's like you know if we start creating stuff like that that start to celebrate and elevate people of color or diverse folks like that's when we start distributing that power and control and start creating more diverse spaces and there's research done that diverse spaces no matter how much time it takes to get to a middle ground like are in way more beneficial to society whether it be you know capital or or people's way of life people feeling included it's just it's just way more beneficial uh when it comes to having a more diverse leadership group space there's a lot more voices being heard, a lot of different perspectives that are being looked at. And it this quote keeps sticking with me. One of my friends said it to me a few few months ago. It's like, you know, you pay now or you pay later. Right. Um, you know, do you wanna do you wanna pay now to learn about race and racism and reconcile our history? Or do you wanna pay later in people calling you out on your bullshit and being flagged as a racist and you know being problematic and no one wanting to work with you ever again so it's like when you know when where do you want to put your investment so that's kind of yeah vaso i want to be respectful of your time we're kind of coming up against uh 
the limit here, but before we close, I'd love to just, um, kind of ask, you know, if there were one thing you'd want a listener, um, who's listened to this and, and maybe their comfort has been challenged a little bit or their worldview has been rattled or, or whatever they're, they've learned something. Um, what's kind of the one takeaway you'd like people to, to come away from this with? That's a great question. I always tell people to reframe politically correct to compassionate. You know, so that's kind of my trying to push people to come from a space of love and compassion instead of constantly questioning and being the devil's advocate when it comes to a lot of these different spaces. Yeah, you hear the term politically correct and, you know, it's just becomes divisive really quickly, whereas compassion is pretty unequivocally a good thing. Um, Right. I don't think we can corrupt that word necessarily. And yeah, that comes down to everything I've been talking about prior is like putting people first and language matters and yeah. representation matters. And like, you know, it all breaks down to a lot of these little structures that we've created. Well, Vasu, this has been phenomenal. I appreciate your time, your story, your passion, uh, the work you're doing. How can people, how can people find your work online? How can people follow you? Um, yeah, most of my stuff, given that I'm a millennial, 29 year old, mostly is focused on instagram so my tag is at basu underscore sojitra so yeah that's kind of where i do a lot of my advocacy sharing either action items or my perspective on life or my friends perspectives on life and a lot of these uh, issues that we always constantly talk about and try to find solutions for those are that's my main main method Awesome. Well, thanks for sharing some of your time and wisdom with us. Uh, I hope at some point we got the chance to, to meet in person. Stay safe. Good luck this winter. And um, we'll be talking soon. Yeah, take care. Thanks, Justin. Thanks for listening to A New Angle. We really appreciate it. A New Angle is underwritten by First Security Bank and Blackfoot with support from the University of Montana College of Business and Consolidated Electrical Distributors. AJ Williams is our producer. Jeff Ament, John Wicks, and VTO made our music, and Jeff Meese is our master of all things sound. If you have any questions, suggestions, comments, insults, whatever, please email me at a new angle at umontana.edu. If you like what you heard, tell your friends about us. Thanks a lot, and see you next time. <laughs>